Welcome to the Embodied Sounds podcast, where we explore how music and sound add to our collective well-being in mind, body, and spirit. In order to keep this podcast free of advertising, please consider joining our Patreon community. Your support will go towards the creation of this show, as well as original music compositions and recording projects to help us all reduce stress and live a healthier and happier life. Learn more at www embodiedsounds.com. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Embodied Sounds podcast. My name is Joshua Sam Miller. I'm a musician and producer and just fascinated person on how music and sound can play a healing role in our lives. And today I'm very excited to welcome my friend Ege onto the show where we're going to learn about his experience in life as a musician and multi-instrumentalist, teacher, software engineer, and very uh, experienced worldwide performer. So very uh, grateful to have him with us and uh, look forward to what we get to dive into today. So welcome, Ege. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. You know, I can chat about music all day, every day. So just to do it on a platform where others get to hear it, that's just the icing on top. Right on. And um, maybe uh, could you tell us a bit about where we're finding you tonight? Where are you located uh, physically in the world and kind of what's uh, what's in your immediate surroundings? Absolutely. I am in my creation zone. This is my home studio. We call it the honeycomb, as you can see from the sound panels behind me. So um, it's a tiny little room in our uh, humble apartment in Oakland, California. Um, I created this space to be able to do live streams or join yoga classes to play music, but also just to practice. So this is this is usually where I sit to play music and, and all my instruments are all over the place in this room. Amazing. I've, uh, I've had the pleasure of getting to visit Ege Studio and I can definitely attest it's very state of the art. So, um, yeah, it's a great spot. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the instruments that you play and what, um, what style of music really is, uh, is most calling for you these days? Well, if I I describe my music as improvisational music, you know, it's, it's hard to settle on one, but I'm as, many of us are, many of our musician friends are, I am influenced by hundreds and hundreds of different artists, different traditions, different music styles, notations, all of that. But um, I find my home in uh, classical Indian style. uh, And my main instrument is the sitar. Um, But I also, I grew up playing electric guitar and garage bands. Uh, you know, later uh, got into a Indian music phase and never got out of it, so to say. But I'm also, um, you know, Turkish, uh, a native Turkish person. And uh, I also have a lot of Middle Eastern sensibility in my music. So I play the saz, which is also called balama, a couple of hand pans, a um, couple of flutes, you know. Um, but m- for the most part, um, what it boils down to is playing stringed instruments, uh, with an improvisational style that's based on the classical Indian system. Mm. Beautiful. And c- can you tell us a little bit about how you began uh, playing music? What was some of your early inspirations? And did you have like a moment where you woke up one day and said, this is this is who I am. I'm a musician. Was it, uh, was it more gradual than that? Did it kind of evolve slowly? Um, how did you get started in, in doing everything that you're doing now? Sure. So it was definitely like gradual, gradual, then a big jump, gradual, gradual, then a big jump. Uh, you know, I never really wanted to play an instrument. It was my dad who basically forced me to it. And his reasoning was when he was in college, he wanted to play the guitar, but he didn't have money to buy a guitar and he didn't want to borrow money. 
And for him, it was always uh, something that he a little bit regretted and missed out on in his opinion. So he wanted to make sure both me and my younger brother, you know, grew up at least playing instruments. Uh, that said, you know, growing up in a Middle Eastern culture, music is all around you always. You know, people like to dance, people like to move. Uh, there's a rich music culture. So um, I grew up in that kind of environment. Um, I think I was six, seven years old. My dad bought me a really cheap mandolin. And that's where I started playing a little bit here and there. And then afterwards, I graduated to guitar. Uh, got a little bit of lesson, uh, but again, like my heart wasn't honestly in in it. Uh, I just wanted to go, you know, be a teenager. Um, it wasn't until I was like sixth grade, so like around middle school, uh, I switched to a um, middle school called Tars American College. This is a school with a lot of tradition. It's um, it's an American high school in, you know, southern Turkey uh, that has been there for over 130 years now. Uh, and it has deep roots in music, but also like um, American style of learning. Uh, so when I got there, I started learning English. I was um, looking up to all the way to the high schoolers and the seniors. And that year, my first year in that school, uh, the school band, which is called Echo, uh, the seniors of that band released a CD, an album. And I was holding the album in my hand and I couldn't believe that people I know could make, produce an album. Uh, and that after that, you know, I knew that I was, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to release an album. I'm going to get into the Echo band. Uh, and, you know, for context, this echo band started in 1969. So, you know, whatever class you were in, uh, so if you're a graduate of 1969, you would be echo 69, 70, 71, unbroken chain, you know, so it's kind of like a fraternity in a way. Um, and we were echo 2003, uh, you know, so and we released our album. Um, but, you know, so th th that really helped me. Uh, decide that, okay, I'm going to do this. And I would never forget being a senior in high school, sleeping in a studio for a week uh, and getting to learn all these nuances about how to capture music, how to record it. And at the end, have something physical that you can give to people. Uh, it's funny, I was listening to what we did. I, you Maybe once a year, every year, maybe even every two years or something, I will listen to those and just kind of reminisce. And like my last listen through a couple of weeks ago, I was like, we did a good job. It still holds up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so after that, when I came to college, I discovered a little bit more about what music means to me and what my heart wants to sing. And I found out that I am not good at playing other people's music. I forget what I play if I learn a song. I can't read music. Uh, but I found out about blues and jazz and improvisation and started learning scales and all these um, holes were being filled. You know, it's like pieces of the puzzle were coming together to give me a much complete picture. Uh, so it was during college that I uh, really discovered what it means for me to play music. And at the end of college is when someone introduced me to uh, Ravi Shankar and the sitar. And after that, it just kind of took off, uh, you know, um, it's probably the biggest thing about my identity is music. Uh, you know, at the same time, I, I mean, I, I can't picture life without music. You know, it's becoming that everything is music. I look outside, I watch the leaves fall and I see music. <laughs> but also I know that music means coming here, sitting right here and practicing, you know, so that that never left me. Um, yeah, I, I hope I didn't go off on too much of a tangent there. No, not at all. That was fascinating, fascinating story. I, um, 
I just love hearing too how your father was so supportive of uh, of that first instrument. What a he was. I'll tell you a little bit about a little more about that. It was like during the summers he really wanted me to practice. Uh, the guitar, you know, and I had a big acoustic guitar and my fingers would hurt and I was little, I could barely reach the neck and um, and all I wanted to do was go outside and hang out with my friends and, you know, we, we had like a nice group of friends, uh, you know, girls and boys and we would go out together and and he just wanted me to practice and he would say practice, practice and I would like pretend practicing for 10 minutes and leave and one day he had it. And my dad is the calmest, more hum- calmest, more, most humble person. But sometimes something ticks him off. I don't know what I did that, that day. Something ticked him off. And he grabbed the guitar and said, yeah, if we're not going to practice, I'm going to throw it outside the balcony. And we lived in like the third floor. And like, this is it. Like, you, you don't want this guitar. I'm going to break it. And I was like, no, no, don't do it. Okay, okay. I get it. Okay. Yeah, you know, we came to that point, like it was kind of, you know, but that, like, I don't have any more examples of anything like that. And we look back on that day because he knows all the music I do right now. And he is a fan of my work. And we, we laugh, you know, we laugh on that day uh, about how it came to that point where I was just like, I didn't play. And he was kind of frustrated with me, um, you know. Oh, what a great story. And how, how those early moments just stick with you and, and come back. You know, I, I uh, can definitely relate to that with stories from my own parents and teachers that pushed me, you know, more so than I wanted at the time. But I'm certainly grateful for all of that encouragement, you know. And Yeah, me too. Sometimes you need a little tough love. Totally. Yeah. And I... Um, I imagine some of that is, is cultural too, you know, so it's, it's always, um, very, very personal experience. Um, you were saying before, like in college, you discovered really what music means to you. And I'm, I'm curious if you want to tell us more about that. Like what, what does music really mean for you as, uh, as the person that you've become? You know, if, Probably my answer to that question would change depending on the day, the mood, everything. But um, I see it almost as a universal language that governs this universe. It's like numbers in time, you know, that's what the Greeks thought of music when they thought of how to describe it in most simple term. Uh, For me uh, personally, it's also about having fun like really squeezing the juice out of the lemon that is this life. Uh, And I, I'm able to do that most with music, you know, of course, a beautiful day on the beach, just hanging out, uh, you know, or going on a beautiful hike or whatever that, you know, um, gives you joy in life. You can feel the same. Uh, But for me, no matter where I am, you put an instrument in my hand, or not even a play my chest doesn't matter. Uh, that's that's when I like really am able to be present and tap into this infinite ocean that is life, you know. Um, and that that came through with the understanding of improvisation as a technique, you know. Before I was frustrated in music, and I always felt like I was hitting dead ends when I would learn a song. You know, I would go practice a song for a week, learn it, and then a week later I would forget it. Um, and, you know, I never really had formal music education, um, at least Western European education, that is, you know, reading notes off of a sheet. Um, so I never was able to refer back to something and say, okay, this is how it is and I can just play it. It was always learning by looking, learning by muscle memory. Uh, you know, so um, I came to a point in college where I was like, okay, you know, I love this, but I don't know if, if there's anything for me here. Um, but I, I was still digging. I was still, I knew that there were more resources av- available to me in the United States where I went to college compared to southern Turkey where I grew up. So I just needed to dig and find something 
and I came across this one week uh, guitar program in Berkeley School of Music in Boston. That was my freshman year, uh, end of the summer. So like in August, I went there and I stayed there for a week. And again, all the pieces of the puzzle started coming together. The teachers were there, amazing. And, um, you know, I never thought of the concept of a scale, for example, before, because I would just memorize my power chords for a song. Uh, and when it started to like something really shifted in me that that whole week and I came and basically um, digested that for two years uh, after that, after that one week of like knowledge was being unpacked for two weeks, practicing every day, just sitting down, figuring it out, putting a blues song and trying to play over it, um, you know, and things started to come together once I, once I discovered that I, you know, my power in music is to improvise. And that's when I started getting these experiences of presence and stillness and, um, you know, abundance, all of that. Hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. I, uh, I'm really fascinated on the, you know, overall holistic benefits that music and sound can bring to our lives and have felt a lot of resonance over the years of getting to getting to meet artists that have really made music a foundational practice in their life. And um, I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective on that and, and ask if you've, uh, if you've noticed yourself improving as a human, uh, as you have developed your musical practice and if so, how, how has that looked for you? Yeah, I mean, the, oh, this, is, this could be the topic itself, you know, that you can talk about for hours. Um, you know, there is, the music is my foundational practice in life. You know, I do yoga, I do meditation, I do all kinds of breath work, everything is one thing. And then there is music. And I'm, I'm not saying they're different, they're completely complementary to each other but um, you know like when I started meditating it wasn't that much of a learning curve because I knew what I knew that feeling of just kind of being single pointedness you know that focus when I'm trying to practice a scale for example or just uh, a certain it doesn't even have to be a scale it can be a song so you really have to focus and you can't you have to kind of uh, dissolve everything else around you and just be there, right? So um, I already knew that because I practice music. Uh, so when I sit down to meditate, it's almost like I'm practicing music, uh, you know. Um, but like on a more personal level, I saw the whole arc of the ego. Um, you know, I grew up with a lot of musicians around me uh, and the musician ego is a real thing. Uh, and it took me a lot to get to say just that. Uh, and there is a lot of competition. There is a lot of who is faster, who is more technical, well, who sounds better, whose voice is better between musicians. As much as there is love, there is also a lot of that. And I met a lot of musicians um, that I've experienced that. And my, me, myself, was also included in that category. Uh, and, you know, confronting that part of my ego and, you know, slowly shedding it has been one of the most beneficial things that I've done in my life. Uh, and, you know, and it's not, it's like this genuine humbleness it's, it's, it's a type of humbleness you cannot fake and it's it's hard to let go uh, and you know the more I practice the more amazing people I meet the more I get humbled by my own instruments uh, the more I can let go of that grasp that the musician ego had on my true self 
and you know that that probably is what's ringing through these days more than anything and um it's kind of really inspiring to me to look back and say hey like if, if this certain situation happened in the past i would be upset i would you know be upset about somebody else getting a gig that i wanted <clears throat> or something like that let's say it doesn't really matter uh, but now there's not that much left on that you know and um like if i can do that with the most important thing in my life which is music then everything else i can also do right so um as you were saying like we us musicians we learn life lessons through music and that's definitely happening to me uh in in all kinds of categories including what i just talked about mm. wow such a great story Age. thank you thank you for the vulnerability and the authentic sharing of of dissolving your competitive ego um that's a very beautiful journey to go on and and to drop from the head into the heart to really you know guide us as um as people I, I have personally found to be very um very important to to connect with and uh so so many people never experience that you know there are there are so many people who um who really are are kind of trapped i i have found up in in the mind and and i know i go up there too a lot and really get stressed and anxious and depressed at times and really um find it difficult to escape that uh that very downward cycle and my music practice is always there and it's always something that can uh ground be grounding and be very um much a healthy reminder of what's important um so it's you know it's part of the mission in creating this podcast is to share that that teaching and that experience in in our lives as musicians to inspire people to find a practice that really works for you um maybe it's music if so there's some great resources you know available um maybe it's something different and yeah. and i really admire the the journey you've been on to humble yourself uh i i i'm i'm curious if there was a particular instrument that really forced you to do that and um mm -hmm. if you have any stories around maybe a moment where that was a struggle or something uh i know that's always a a journey yes well absolutely so i mean i dabble in a lot of instruments i can't help it i still love the ever exchange that i get from instruments something sometimes instruments come into this room they stay for a couple of months then they're gone you know i i give them away i sell them i let them go sometimes they're here for life uh you know and it kind of depends right um but one instrument in particular came into my field 12 years ago it's the turkish ney it's uh, made from reed um it's the simplest instrument you can imagine there is no whistle nothing in it you and the instrument become one to make sound out of it this top part is uh, made out of bull's horn uh very rare these days to get bull's horn they usually now nowadays make it with plastic So 12 years ago, I, I was reading a lot of Rumi. Uh, Rumi has been a great teacher to me. Uh, you know, we, where Rumi lived most of his life is three hours away from where I grew up. So I, I always felt a connection to his poetry and his teachings. And um, like throughout college, throughout high school, I always was very drawn to Sufism and Um, his teachings and this is their main instrument this is the instrument of patience um, and it's a powerful instrument people who can really play this they just make magic with it and you know i i grew up with the strings i never actually played 
a breath instrument. Uh, but in 2009, when I went home, back to home, back home uh, to visit, I was going to be there for about three months. And I decided this would be a good time to find a teacher, get an A, and practice and learn. Man, it was hard. It was so hard. I tried my best and I could barely get one single sound out of the whole instrument. And, you know, throughout that summer, it became a little bit better. Maybe I can hold a basic tune here and there, play some of the level one uh, pitches out of it, maybe. Then I came back to the U.S., I practice, I kept practicing here and there, but over time, you know, it just became something that's sitting over there that I didn't touch. Um, 12 years later, a couple months ago, my brother was talking about going to a yoga retreat and somebody who played the Ney brought their Ney and was playing the, it and he was really inspired by it and he the way he talked about it really encouraged me and i said to myself hey it's the pandemic there's nothing else to do but to learn let's pick it up again let's see what happens 12 years have passed maybe now you can breathe better maybe you have your patience level increased a little bit um, and that was true you know um I still w would say that I am an absolute beginner. Uh, this is a lifetime instrument. But, you know, these days I'm getting so much joy out of practicing this. And usually um, I do my breath work in the morning. I do my meditation. Then I pick this up and, um, you know, play. And uh, it's, it's an amazing sensation. It's, I feel... A little bit uh, self-conscious still, just playing it. Uh, sometimes awkward sounds come out. Sometimes I get my fingering wrong. But um, it's really awesome to be humbled by an instrument, to feel like a beginner, uh, you know. And I, I know the value. I know the importance of being a student in music uh, and I'm I'm deeply deeply feeling that with this instrument, and will probably do will um, continue to for the rest of my life. Um, you know, I'm I'm grateful for the person who made this and sent it to me uh, from Turkey a couple months ago. And you know, I also realized the the one uh, nay I had 12 years ago wasn't that all that great which made it a little bit harder to play but of course i didn't know um, yeah so this is an instrument that humbled me and continues to do so every day and um, i'm happy to be of service to this lineage uh, and you know just just learn learn from this piece of reed Wow, thank you, my brother. That is so beautifully said and articulated. Uh, I'm curious if you are feeling called to to play some uh, Turkish ne. Would you like to to share uh, some of the beautiful I'm making sound? A sound? Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. No pressure. We're all students of life. Yeah. I've heard you play many times, and it's absolutely beautiful. So. Oh, thank you. I do need to raise my leg for uh, with a yoga block, but let's see. Yeah, it's kind of hard to hear it um, with the headphones on, but I just love this. It's it's so it's it's like the sound is so close to human voice. Um, 
And it's just a powerful instrument. And, you know, through this, I'm also learning uh, more about my own cultural music, the Turkish classical style, uh, which I haven't really dove into all that much before. Um, this is the world of the makams and the microtones and um, all that. Um, and, you know, it, it, it also encouraged me to learn a whole complete new system. Uh, and that's, again, like, sign me up, you know. If I'm going to be a beginner, I'm all for it. Fantastic. That sounded beautiful, my friend. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. I, I was starting to go into a very kind of deep state, actually, in just only those few moments of sharing. And um, wow, I mean, such a gift that we have these sounds available. I want to learn more about this kind of connecting back to your own roots through this particular instrument. I I can understand that journey myself. Uh, I'm coming back to the clarinet right now, which I played as a child. And um, I actually wanted to be a percussionist in third grade and I auditioned for the drums, but I, I failed the audition. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, play the clarinet. And I was so uh, upset at the time. I, I said, no, I want to be a drummer and I don't want to play the clarinet, but I'm I'm so happy now that I was given that chance to learn uh, a melodic instrument and getting to connect back to it really has brought me closer to my, uh, my roots in my spiritual practice as a Jewish man living in the 21st century and really listening back to these ancient sounds that have been played for, you know, thousands of years. And, um, yeah. I'm I'm noticing that that's really affecting me in life in many ways to um to accept more of my own lineage and my story and understand like how we wound up here in this moment that we're in today um and I'm I'm just curious if you've been on a similar journey as you've kind of dove in deeper with an instrument from your own heritage Absolutely. I mean, there's definitely a big uh, kind of share right there because um, when I was growing up, I thought any music that wasn't heavy metal was totally uncool and not worth listening to. If it didn't have heavy guitar sounds, distortion, um, it, it was lame, to be perfectly honest. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> uh, but, you know... Um, your surroundings, your, you know, like my cousins at the time were the ones that really got me into listening to heavy metal. And man, I'm, I'm so thankful for them because uh, they introduced me to some amazing bands and, uh, uh, you know, the guitar and like really my love for music comes from loving those bands when I was young. And we all know that feeling when we're really uh, into a certain type of music or a band when we're growing up it's, it's life you know you put up their posters and you wear their t-shirts and uh, you're such a deep fan uh, and I was like that just this Turkish kid that never saw any of those bands uh, but was a big fan uh, later in life you know like middle school high school I started kind of branching out a little bit and as I branched out more uh, listened to some what you might call softer music uh, I was like this is cool I dig this and that that itself is still going on today you know um, like especially growing up in Turkey like the f Turkish folk music Turkish classical music at least in my area was kind of considered oh, I don't really want to say this but this is the truth it's, it was kind of like the uneducated men's music you know it, it, it was uh, sort of like music for the poor or whatever you would call it at least that's what I was conditioned to believe uh, you know um, like whatever was popular was actually heavily influenced by the western music and it still is 
um, even if it had some Turkish style in it, the, the instrument used in it, the popular music at the time was most likely all Western instruments. And, you know, we, we all bought into this, uh, you know, like, and I remember this, I kind of feel bad about this. My, my brother wanted to learn the Turkish sauce. And I was like, oh, that's lame. Like, why do you want to do that? Go learn the guitar. And, you know, uh, he still kind of jokes about that. But um, so like when I was in college, I, I really became a music enthusiast and I wanted to learn about music of all cultures, all traditions, all systems, everywhere. Uh, I, I learned about like the music of the African diaspora. I learned about uh, classical music. I learned about Indian classical music. And the more I learned, the more I found out that, wow, the music is something that goes deep. It's not whatever is immediate in the market right now. You got to kind of dig yourself in there to find what you're looking for and that ultimately you know brought me back to turkish music um it it i was never i was like always one step behind you know i was ve always very close for example i would listen to turkish rock music i would li which had heavy influences of turkish classical music or um and you know ultimately it was through certain artists and certain influences that came in my life that uh, I, I fell in love with my own culture's music. And once that happened, you know, as a musician, I got to take that to the next level, which means study it, right? What, what is this system? Where does it come from? What are the influences that made the system the system that it is? Like, why do they use microtones? Uh, wh where did that, that come from? What's the Makam system? Uh, and the more I find out about it, the more I was able to make connections to classical Indian music, which I've been studying a lot longer officially than the Turkish classical music. Um, so the more I found parallels, the more I found that we might call something something, and uh, over there in India they call it something else, but they actually have a common thread and um, those are always really awesome moments. So, um, you know, it, it was like many little things that happened that brought me back to the roots. Um, and, you know, I think it, it really is solidifying with this particular instrument in my hand uh, and like becoming more official to me. Um, and the good thing about this, you you know, when you have, when you go back to your roots, like you already know where you are, you feel at home. Like it's, it's, it's not really new territory. So that, that feels quite, quite good. Hmm. I love that. I love that story. Yeah. It's, it's always fun to reflect back on who we were as teenagers and, yeah. you know, what was important then versus what's important now. And I think uh, m many of us often, have uh, favorite bands at different stages in life and to remember who you were listening to based on who you were at the time, uh, what you were going through, what was happening in the world, you know, it becomes such a, such a way to, to reflect. And, and I, um, I certainly believe in the power of reflection as in, a, in life as a practice to take time, you know, maybe monthly on full moons or annually, you know, to think, oh, where was I a year ago? Where was I two years ago? And, um, and how, how can music be a reminder of that? Like, oh, yeah, that concert was incredible. <laughs> I remember that like it was yesterday and just has a way of like, like bringing us back to moments that otherwise you can't really access some um, you know, in a different, in other, other ways, uh, something special about sound, I think, in that. Yeah, sound creates like really deep memories, you know. Like if you ever listen to a live recording, you close your eyes or you're there in the, you know, concert hall, in the festival that you were in, doesn't really matter. One of the reasons why I love live music 
or listening to live music after the fact is that and I've been kind of obsessed about recording my live music uh, so that I can make a memory of it just to me it's better than taking a photo uh, okay let's let's say more about that um, what do you mean why is why is recording music better than taking a photo recording live music Re recording live music to me is better than taking a photo um, because it's like I can I can when I when I listen to a recording that I might have made with friends or myself or um, or even a concert that I was in um, it's such a visceral memory you know I, I literally I can close my eyes I can feel everything I, it's like I'm there uh, it's it's an instant trans transportation to that moment uh, and you know like I, I can even remember all the little things that happen oh I was doing this while my friend playing the other instrument over there was doing that and then we had this funny moment and then we looked at each other or I'll look over there and say well my friend was dancing over there like this doing this kind of move um, and there was a campfire happening and and all this stuff you know so it's it's it really 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 brings me back um, you know especially uh, if, if it's a moment that was shared with many other people uh, I think it has even more power because like we collectively created that memory in a way and the recording is sort of like captures that moment that atmosphere that energy uh, and when you press play um, you get to access it again uh, you know um, like we might have take hundreds, taken hundreds of photos that night that day uh, but none of them do the same uh, impact to me at least than a 30 second music clip totally totally I'm I'm curious if you would agree with with this um, statement. Uh, do you feel that uh, music and and the sound experiences that you've cultivated in your life have have they made you a better listener? One hundred percent. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And I know for sure that that's one of the like first requirements. To be a good musician is to be a good listener, uh, you know, and there are so many different levels to what that means. F first, most immediate level that anybody can have is becoming a good mus listener of music, you know. So to me, a musician is not someone necessarily who, someone who necessarily plays an instrument. To me, uh, a music, music librarian, uh, I like to call him, is also a musician, meaning someone who goes deep into a band, knows all their stuff, uh, knows the history of the band, or a particular genre of music, or maybe many bands or many musicians, knows about their uh, life, their uh, autobiography, um, what inspired them to write the music like digging all these stories uh, but ultimately becoming a listener of that music if you're doing that you're a musician you know so like a lot and i i had a lot of these examples in college i i a lot of my friends were grateful dead fans and i never have seen the level of appreciation and fanship uh, to a band than any other band that is in existence you know these people knew what the band played at 1969 at cornell university and what song led to a what other song and they weren't even alive then you know uh, but it doesn't matter so like that if that's that's level one if you listen to music with, um, genuinely with all of your heart and you go deep you're a musician um on more of a like practical sense, you know, when we play with other musicians or ourselves, 
there is this feedback happening, like there's this constant feedback happening. Part of you is playing, part of you is listening to what you're playing. Uh, and this is like constant back and forth. Uh, to me, the best musicians I've, I've played with are the best listeners uh, that know how to respond to the you know, prompts that I am presenting and then they're giving back. It almost becomes this flawless conversation. But even if I'm playing by myself, that same thing can happen where I'm playing, but I'm also listening. And I'm listening and I'm playing. Uh, and I'm doing this on such a uh, uncon unconscious level that it became, becomes flawless. It becomes automatic. Uh, but it's also conscious. You know, it's also like, it's maybe unconscious is not the right word. It's super conscious, you know. Um, so much so that you don't have to pay attention to it, but you're also paying attention to it. The first times I've actually experienced this, uh, my knees buckled. I didn't know what to do with myself. Uh, you know, and a lot of musicians experience this. You know, often I hear musicians say, well, I, I could see myself, you know, being played by a divine power or I was having an out-of-body ex experience or... Um, you know, there's like many different levels and there are different ways to experience this, I'm sure. Uh, and I remember when I was first like really brought to those moments, I didn't know what to do with myself. And my knees would buckle, I would fall into the floor. Or, um, and I, I also was, I would become uh, self-conscious because if I'm looking at myself, listening to myself, being, you know, playing the instrument, then I would lose it all, like the magic would be gone, you know? Uh, but just like anything with a little bit of experience, your comfort level grows and um, you know that those moments come, those moments go. Uh, all, there is no goal to reach that moment, uh, but it's there always. Uh, it's something that we strive for when we play, you know? So, and you can't do it without listening. The more you listen, the easier that becomes. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter how fast, how technical, how many different instruments you can play. You can play uh, a single note, but if you play that with listening, uh, then it becomes magic, you know? Um, and you can take that to your rest of your life uh, because what, who's to say that music ends when, when it ends? You know, every conversation is music. Every interaction that we have is music with ourselves and with others, the rest of the world. Uh, whatever happens to us, you go and drive in traffic, that's music, right? You know, and the more you listen, the more you pay attention to all the things that are happening around you, the, the better, the easier for you to respond to it, you know, flawlessly. Wow, my brother, such wisdom in that in that one there, I, I feel like um, there's, there's so much resonance, so much shared experience and uh, real value that our listeners will, will gain from your sharing. So thank you so much for, you know, for being a, an open channel to allow both the, the beautiful music and the life experience to, to come through. It's it's a very um, it, a unique path in life, I think, to to be caught by this um, this drug of sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can describe it that way in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. uh, this medicine of sound, and yeah. and to really feel the the benefits that it can bring to our lives is just such a gift. And I want to honor you for the work that you've put into. Uh, to channel some of that for us to re re enjoy and receive. So um, I'm curious if there's any anything else you'd like to share. Well, I guess my one word of encouragement is that, you know, a, a quote by Rumi comes to mind right now. Uh, we are as the flute, as the music is in us. We are as the mountain as the echo 
is in us, you know. And I, I truly believe in this, and I probably butchered the, the, the poetry here, but the essence, the, what I get from that is that anybody is a musician. Anybody, it's never too late for anyone to be a student of music. Uh, the fact of the matter is that you are a student of music. Maybe you just didn't know yet. Yeah, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you're in life, and you notice patterns, that's rhythm. You know, if, if you hear a bird sing, that's melody. Yeah. If two sounds sound good to you, two sounds together sound good to you, that's harmony. Uh, it's, all a, it's all a game of noticing that, right? That's becoming a good listener. So my, my encouragement is that, do, do that. Pick up something. If you have never played an instrument, Try something. Try singing. Try tapping your chest rhythmically. One, two, three, four. Doesn't matter. Uh, sing, dance. If 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 you are, if you didn't sing or dance today, then this day wasn't lived enough. You know. Uh, do that every day, and things will change. I promise to you. Amazing, my brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we will put links to all of Ege's projects in the show notes. Um, is there any particular project you'd like to tell us about? Yeah, sure. Of course. Um, I'm always working on things these days, especially I'm glad to be working on things. Uh, I am really excited for this album with my dear friend Madhu that's coming up. Uh, probably sometime in March. Uh, that's going to be an exploration into a mantra uh, of uh, goddesses from the Hindu tradition. So each song is going to be dedicated to a goddess. And we are pretty much done with this album. It's going to be out hopefully sometime in March. Um, so be on, be on the lookout for that. But everything else I do is all over everywhere. Like wherever you listen to music, you can find me. Amazing. Wow. An album dedicated to Hindu goddesses. I will definitely be checking that out. Uh, sounds beautiful. And uh, can't wait to play with you more myself because we have uh, yeah. our own jams in the works. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for watching. This was the Embodied Sounds podcast episode with Iggy Sanli from Oakland, California. And we hope you will stay tuned for more uh, sharing from artists and healers, ceremonialists, and sound experts from around the world. All for now, peace out. Mm -hmm.